Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us today as we discuss our 2021 Mid-Year Outlook here in Wealth and Fiduciary Services. I'm Anthony Valeri, Director of Investment Management, and with me is Robert Spendlove, our Economic and Public Policy Officer. We'll go spend the next 20 minutes or so discussing the economy and our outlook for stock and bond markets over the remainder of 2021. With that, let's go ahead and get started. I'll turn it over to Robert to cover the economy. Thanks so much, Anthony. Uh, it's good to be with you today. Uh, so I just want to talk about a, a few of the big uh, economic trends that we're seeing right now that are impacting uh, the, the overall economy. Uh, one of the main indicators that we follow very closely is the gross domestic product. And you can see here how historic uh, what we've been experiencing is compared to, uh, to the past. You really have to go back to the 1950s or the 1970s to, uh, to see the kind of impacts that we saw over the last year. Just dramatic drops uh, in, the, uh, in the second quarter of 2020 and then a big increase in the third quarter. Uh, first quarter came in 6.4%, uh, so nice recovery. We're expecting that the second quarter GDP when it comes out uh, will be even higher than that. Uh, looking at about 9% uh, growth or more. So the economy is coming back very strongly uh, and is looking very good. If we look at, at uh, inflation, uh, it's another uh, story of accelerating growth. So this is the consumer price index. Uh, essentially, it's the, the price of the, the goods and services that people, uh, that people purchase in the economy. And we see uh, not only... Uh, strong growth, but accelerating growth in our uh, in our inflation, coming in at 5.4 percent for June of 2021. Now, the Fed's goal, if you look at that yellow line running across the middle, uh, the Federal Reserve wants uh, inflation to be about two percent. But for the past several years, uh, it's been running a little bit below that, kind of uh, just a little bit cooler than that two percent. Well, we've, we've fully reversed that. Now we're seeing growth much above that. If you look at that chart uh, down at the bottom, we start to uh, uh, tap into some of, the, uh, some of the data that's going on. Not only is that year over year at 5.4%, it came in above our expectations. And then the month over month, uh, which means just looking at the growth from May to June, came in at nine tenths of a percent. Uh, if you annualize that, that, that would uh, equate to about 10% inflation growth over the last year. And then if we strip out the more volatile sections, uh, food and, uh, and energy still coming in at 4.5%. This is the largest overall uh, inflation growth that we've seen since 2008. And the big debate though, is how long will this go? Uh, is this temporary or transitory or are we seeing a, a new trend coming in with our inflation? Uh, looking at the, on the producer side, uh, the producer price index actually just came out today, uh, just a couple hours ago. So we haven't been able to update the, the chart on this yet. But again, similar trend of accelerating uh, inflation. The, the PPI that just came out this morning uh, shows 7.3%. So that 6.6% has now accelerated even further up to 7.3%. The difference between the consumer price index and the pr uh, producer price index is you're comparing uh, essentially the, the, the buyers is the CPI and the sellers is the PPI. The PPI is also another uh, indication of what we should expect to see uh, in the next few months because as those producers uh, are selling products for more uh, consumers are paying more for their products as well. And again, when you dig into those uh, the, the, those uh, actual numbers, not only are the prices coming in higher, uh, but they're coming in above the consensus expectation. Uh, so uh, you know we we expected in the in the previous month for it to be about half a percent a month over month came in at 0.8 percent uh, year over year expected 6.5 percent came in at 6.6. So we're see, seeing this accelerating inflation going on around the economy. Uh, uh, so there's one side of it. The, the Fed has something called a dual mandate, and uh, their mandate is number one, to keep uh, inflation low and stable, 
And number two is uh, full employment. So th their goal is to get as many people uh, in the economy working as possible. And so uh, we, we see this disconnect going on in the economy right now. And uh, what, what this chart is showing, this is called the JOLT chart, it's showing uh, job openings in the economy. So we had over 9.2 million job openings in the last month. That is remarkable, especially since the unemployment rate in the United States uh, is only at 5.9%. Before the, before the uh, pandemic, it was 3.5%. So we're much higher in unemployment than we were pre-pandemic. And we're still, we still have uh, 6.8 fewer jobs in America today than before the pandemic. So you could say that we've got 6.8 million people out of work today compared to before the pandemic, but we've got 9 million open jobs. And so there's this disconnect going on in the labor market. Uh, if we look at the next slide, uh, we can really start to dig into uh, some of the reasons why this is happening. So the labor force participation rate is uh, the rate of essentially, uh, if you take the total population and divide out those people who are working or actively looking for a job, that's your labor force participation rate. And then I've broken it down a little bit more into age groups. So the yellow line is teenagers. The uh, black line is the, the, the top line number. Uh, the blue line is prime age or 25 to 54. And the green line is ages 55 and over or the boomer generation. And you see some really interesting trends. So the, the teenagers, uh, teenage labor force participation is actually higher today than it was before the pandemic hit. So uh, we, we were pulling teenagers back into the labor force very effectively. Uh, prime age, you can see that it dropped dramatically uh, when the pandemic hit, has recovered about halfway, and then has kind of held steady at that same level. Uh, hasn't come back to where it was before the pandemic, but is, uh, uh, but is about the same as, as it's been for the last few months. But the really interesting one is that green line. And what we see, uh, what that message tells us is that even as the economy is improving, we're seeing uh, a trend of older workers leaving the labor force. So we're seeing this uh, retirement wave of people leaving the labor force uh, as, the, uh, as the economy continues to recover. This is gonna be very difficult. This is gonna be one of the biggest challenges is uh, can we, or first, how do we bring those people back in the labor force? But the bigger question is, is it possible to bring them back into the labor force? Is that, is that higher level of participation even attainable uh, going forward? Uh, and then kind of bringing it all together, uh, so the, the Fed, Federal Reserve is looking at all this data. Uh, the Federal Reserve uh, uh, sets uh, interest rates and also uh, sets mon monetary policy for uh, the United States. And what this is showing is, you know, a lot of people say, well, how does the Fed, you know, create money? Uh, this is the way that the Fed creates money, and it's through uh, uh, bond buying or changes to their balance sheet. You can see that the major sources, the, the places where they go to buy bonds is primarily mortgage-backed securities and treasury securities. And the Fed, uh, since the pandemic hit, has been uh, dramatically increasing their balance sheet. They've been buying uh, bonds in uh, very large numbers, essentially $120 billion a month that the Fed has been uh, uh, buying bonds over the last uh, several uh, over the last year. So what that means is the Fed is creating 120 billion dollars uh, uh, every single month through their bond buying. Uh, the big debate right now is how long should the Fed continue this accommodative policy uh, uh, of trying to grow the economy when this is uh, at least in part, adding to some of those inflationary gains. The struggle that the Fed has is that employment is still lower than they'd like it to be. Uh, and the, the Fed wants to continue to be accommodative as long as the threat of the, of the economic turmoil uh, continues to persist. And then the other question is, how long will this high inflation continue? Is it transitory? Is it temporary? Or we see more inflation coming uh, in the future? Anthony, uh, to you now. 
All right. Thanks very much, Robert. I appreciate it. And that's a good backdrop and segue into how we look at uh, the world and the financial markets from here. A lot of the strength in GDP that Robert alluded to, the bounce back in the economy has powered uh, a very strong first half of the year. So before we look into the second half, a brief recap of the first half, very strong performance across all uh, asset classes, or I should say risk asset classes, master limited partnerships, REITs af rebounding after a difficult 2020. And you look at equity asset classes in the US, leading performance globally, very strong returns, international stock returns also strong. However, this is not sustainable. It's been a very good or very strong first half. And while we expect some continued improvement over the second half, certainly not what we expected, or not this type of pace of performance. Uh, when we look at bonds, they have been a laggard. High quality taxable bonds have been the notable laggard, although they did recover during the second quarter from a historically bad first quarter. Uh, we think it's more a case of low returns going forward, and they still play a key diversification role. But when we look at equities when, uh, uh, regarding the second half, it's important to look back on what's happened in the past when there's been a strong start to the year. So I went back and looked at all of the occasions since 1950 when the S&P 500 as a proxy for US stock exposure increased more than 10% over the first six months of the year. There were 21 such occasions and the data for the second half is, bodes well. So in those prior 21 occasions, the equity market was a posted a positive performance in 18 out of the 21 occurrences. That's an 81% positive rate, as you can see at the bottom of this table. That's above the long-term historic average of about a 70% positive rate with equity market returns. And then if you look at the average and median returns, these are both also above average. And these are performance or total returns over the subsequent six months. So if history is any guide, equity market performance based on that strong first half should benefit and therefore be positive and strong in the second half. Again, we expect more of a mid single digit type return given the strength of performance over the first half. But we do expect that momentum to continue. We think the bull market is alive and well. And referring to Robert's discussion of inflation, stocks are still the best protection against inflation over the longer term. Now let's talk about the, one of the negatives in the equity market. Valuations are expensive. This is talked about a lot in the media, but there are reasons for valuations to be expensive. Low bond yields are one. Important to note that valuations haven't changed much in 2021. Yes, prices have increased, but so have earnings. And that's the key. This PE ratio, although elevated relative to history, has remained stable. We expect it to moderate, and that's one of the reasons why we expect lower returns going forward. We expect valuations to soften even as earnings grow. And so to that point, if you look at earnings growth, it has been remarkable. The recovery from the recession has been very, very strong relative to prior bounce backs from recessions. And really, earnings have surprised for numerous quarters here, and particularly since the third quarter of 2020, Earnings results have been far better than expected. The blue bar show earnings, uh, gray being the expected at earnings for the quarter. And the beats have been very, very impressive, historically good. And you can see the strength in earnings uh, in the first quarter. And we are just now starting second quarter earnings season where the consensus expects a six or by fact set expecting a 63% year over year gain. This is going to be the peak in terms of earnings growth. However, still expect expected 20% earnings growth over the third and fourth quarter of this year. Earnings growth has been so strong that it was started, the expectation for 2021 was for a 23% earnings growth rate. Now it is 37%, so a big upward revision to earnings growth. And this is the key driver of stocks, why stock performance has been so strong. As long as this strong earnings growth remains in place, we expect any pullback to be rather limited and do not expect a bear market. So earnings very supportive of US equities and global equities for that matter as well. However, we are in year two of a bull market and usually that means gains are harder to come by, which it also supports our lower return forecast mid single digits over the second half of 2021. Here we show the current bull market. This is from the March 23, 2020 low. That's the dark blue line. And then three, re, three of the most recent uh, bull markets following a recession. We included 1982, 
because of its um, the close proximity, which of the trajectory versus the current bull market. Same for 2009. You can see all three of these prior bull markets did stumble a bit in year two, and that's just normal. They do have a pullback, you have corrections, sometime multiple pullbacks. So there are declines. We really haven't had that as of yet. This has been, uh, been some modest pullbacks, but they've been very modest at that. If I were to include all of the bull market advances from 1950 following recession, the average decline in year two is just shy of 10%. So it is quite normal to have a pullback. And we certainly think we are due for one. And to that end, although the equity market has had some or has posted record highs recently, it has come from fewer and fewer stocks. That's an indication of fading momentum and a potential sign that there may be a pullback around the corner. We are certainly due for one. And on a historical basis, important to remember that pullbacks are, are in fact normal. Here we show the calendar year return of the, S of the stock market as measured by the S&P 500. 70% of the time, the stock market will post a positive a gain uh, or positive return for the full year. The red dots represent the peak, uh, the peak to trough decline during any given calendar year. And on the far right, you can see that only down 4%, that's the, that's the worst pullback so far in 2021. And relative to history, that is very, very modest. So certainly history would say that we are due for a greater pullback or correction than 4%. Again, certainly due given the strength of returns and really haven't had any significant pullback since the uh, down 10% and 8% in September and October of last year. So pullbacks are normal. We will experience one very likely, I think, in the second half of the year, but important to stay committed to a diversified investment plan. In terms of what we look under the hood for the equity market, growth stocks have begun to reassert themselves in recent weeks. Part of this is due to the spread of the Delta variant of COVID-19, which has proven more infectious, including getting those that are vaccinated infected as well. We've seen an increase in cases in recent weeks, and that has led to some of the lockdown winners reasserting themselves in the market. So some of the big technology names after lagging more traditionally cyclical sectors like energy and financials from November through the end of April, have begun to reassert their dominance. We don't think this is a lasting trend. You can see here that growth has outperformed value for the better part of 15 years. So we do think there is scope for value to outperform and, to and continue to outperform as we do think that the Delta variant is not going to cause hospitalizations to increase even though new cases uh, will be increasing. So the data doesn't bear that out. So we don't see this as a stumbling block to the recovery. And we do think value will begin to reassert itself as the economy continues to expand and that recovery, that reopening continues. And that also applies to international equities. We do think the cheaper valuations there should benefit also as this Delta variant doesn't prove as fearsome as might be initially expected. Now let's move to bonds and the puzzling path of the 10-year treasury yield. It's been a wild ride in the bond market, sharp rise in bond yields in the first quarter and the 10-year treasury yield has declined in the second quarter, down four tenths of a percent which is fairly substantial, a fairly substantial move in what's been a, a pretty volatile year for bonds. Uh, you, this seems contradictory given the strength of the economic data and rising inflation, but there are some supply demand dynamics that are driving this. I'll touch on those now. First one is the strength of international buying, which has really come to the fore in the second quarter. Part of that driven by valuations. If we look at the 10-year treasury yield minus the 10-year German bond yield, we see a notable yield advantage at the end of the first quarter. And that has come down as international investors have come in to buy US treasuries. And that has supported the US treasury market as has an abundance of cash. This is cash that is looking to find a home. It's sitting on bank balance sheets. And when there isn't enough, there aren't enough securities to buy, which is partly the case now, it gets sent to the Fed as an overnight parking spot. And you can just see how this has skyrocketed here in 2021. So lots of cash, much of that uh, has created strong demand from banks and treasuries and have been helping to keep yields down. But as treasury, increase, as treasury supply increases over the coming months of 2021, we think the supply demand balance will slowly ease and we'll see a modest upward pressure to treasury yields once again. So looking for about not too big an increase, but a quarter to half a percent gain in the in the 10-year reversing that decline by year end. So still a headwind for fixed income. It's more of a low return environment. We don't think 
interest rates will skyrocket. And I'll talk more about that at the end. Within fixed income, high yield bonds have become more expensive. If we look at the yield differential between high yield bonds and emerging market debt, for example, it is very, very narrow. The average yield advantage of high yield bonds is narrowed to less than 3%. That is historically low and you're not getting a lot of value on high yield. It's uh, going forward. And every time that yield gap to emerging market debt has narrowed, it's been a good entry point for emerging market debt, or at least shifting more of your bond allocation there. So that's one of the levers we can use to help play a little defense. We do remain defensive with regards to interest rate risk in our bond portfolios, but there are areas that can add value. And again, we do think bonds are a good diversifier for investment portfolios. And then finally, there is concern over inflation. What is that impact on long-term interest rates? And although that will work to push interest rates higher, it's important to note that although the market uh, represented by these yellow bars represents the Fed to raise rates uh, a little bit quicker than what they have currently forecasted, uh, still expecting rates over the long term, and that's represented by the long run, to remain low by historical standards. So the Fed has forecast a long run 2.5% Fed funds rate or overnight lending rate. The bond market is basically saying, I don't think we're going to get there and that rates will remain low by historical comparisons for a very, very long time. We'll see who ultimately proves right. The market has a slightly better track record, but still expect interest rates to remain low for a very long period of time. Again, that doesn't mean big losses in the bond market, it just means a lower pace of or lower returns on a go forward basis. But again, those bonds provide good diversification. So that's our outlook for the remainder of 2021. I want to thank everybody for joining Robert and me today, and we'll look forward to speaking to you again very soon. Thank you.